Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Donny Buchanan, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, Owen. It's a pleasure to be here and um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, mate. This has been a long time coming. I'm stoked to have you with us. Uh, if you do hear any uh, construction noises, that's because we just happen to be in an office and next door there is... Uh, <laughs> it's some... been fun already. Yeah. So uh, we'll try and get do our best to get rid of that. But mate, let's start off with some icebreakers. These are f- a bit of tongue in cheek. Sure. Hard questions. So the first one is, are you more fascinated by the collapse of growth stocks in 2022 or the levitation of the ProMedicus <laughs> share price? Uh, this is a fun one. Thanks, Owen. What a, what a <laughs> way to open. Um, yeah, look, we've been long-term shareholders in ProMedicus, as you probably know, and mm. um, I have sold plenty over the years. It, it does trade on pretty fundamentally expensive multiples, but um, yeah, we still hold a bit of a stake in the portfolio. So I appreciate that it hasn't uh, crumbled like some of the other growth stocks out there because it is a, an extremely high quality business and, and deserves a, a premium multiple. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a longer separate debate that we can have on that. Um, yeah, I guess the it's probably more fascinating the um, the speed with which growth stocks have moved over the last sort of nine to twelve months, and um, yeah, I think it it's created an interesting opportunity for investors now. And um, it's times like these when you know some of those sentiment readings are a flash in extreme fear. Uh, I think it's a good time to be leaning in. So, mm. um, given that's what I do day to day, I'll say that I'm more fascinated by that. Yeah, sure. And did you just you know I chose fascinated, right? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't lost on me. Yeah, yeah okay, well, okay. Well played. Yeah, okay. And the second one is in terms of fascinations. Did you watch the series Byron Bay's? Uh, no. Um, it was very controversial up where I live and uh, didn't have a lot of support. And I'm not one to follow social media or reality TV shows. So, no, it so hasn't no. been on my agenda and, and certainly isn't. Okay, number three. If I gave you the, the chance or the choice, sorry, of $1 million dollars, but you had to invest in just one thing for 10 years minimum. So you can't change it. You've, you've invested. Got it. Yeah. Or $250,000 and you can buy and sell every year and you can diversify it however you like. What would you choose and what would you choose to own, I guess? Um, I think it's a pretty simple decision to start um, with a, a 4X head start in terms of 250 to a million. So I'll take the million every day of the week. Um, I'd be interested to to talk to anyone that would go another way. Um, and I guess, um, l- look, the, it's well published that um, the more people trade, uh, it tends to be value destructive by and large. So uh, I guess that's sort of a base rate, but you're also starting at a, a much higher level. Uh, in terms of what I'd buy, um, look, I'd probably tick a few boxes in one fell swoop here and um, buy property up around the Northern Rivers where I live now. Um, hmm. y- you're asking me, uh, well, I'm, I'm talking about my own street a little bit here, but uh, yeah, I guess it, it it's a productive asset and also gives you um, shelter and security and uh, I value those things. So hmm. yeah, that's where I go with it. Cool. Uh, we're going to talk more about farm, the farm and agriculture and all that sort of stuff towards the back, as well oh, as as well as Promedicus, but Byron Bay's will not get another mention from here on out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, Johnny, how did you get started in investing? We talked off air about you, know, you went to school in Brizzy, lived on a farm. Like, was this was business and investing part of your DNA, or did you just happen across it through books? Or yeah, I, I guess um, trying to keep this fairly short. Um, yeah, come from a farming background in far north Queensland, and. Uh, the eldest son of a farming family, I, I got to do, got allocated a lot of tasks um, as a cheap and readily available labour source for my parents and uh, figured out at a pretty young age that I didn't want to be a farmer. And in some pretty foundational years through the teens, I learned a bit about the stock market. And I guess the 
the penny dropped and uh, it, it rang pretty loudly that you can build an asset base and earn an income without having to sit on a tractor or apply your physical labor in, in some way. And um, that appealed to me. I could see the value of building that and, and sort of the power of compounding over time um, off the back of that. And that led to all my decisions around subjects at school and university and so forth. Um, my parents came across uh, a framework called holistic management and uh, in, in the 90s and there were a few consultants that were around that and there was a lot of talk about off-farm assets and I got exposed to elements of the share market and investing through that and it always, always resonated with me. Um, so I knew that I didn't want to be a farmer. I got a view into these things and, you know, started down that path. And I guess there's been a few little, few dots that have been connected over the years, but uh, yeah, at a foundational level, that's when it really started. So to maybe just to give people context here, where did you grow up? Um, between Innisfail and the Atherton Tablelands on a banana, sugarcane and beef cattle property. Yeah, right. And now you live on a, a much smaller farm, but yes. um, closer to the closer to the beach and a good part of the world. Yeah, yeah. Now it was a bit isolated for me up there. I, I was always expected to take over the family farm, and th there was a bigger property further west, sort of fifty thousand acres, and you could have a substantial business um, between those properties. But it didn't interest me, and um, uh, I didn't want to be a farmer. But I've come full circle, as you sort of pointed out that. Uh, it's a good lifestyle and when my wife and I got to a stage where we wanted to raise children, it was important to me to, to have that as For part sure. of it. And, um, yeah, I think it it offers some good grounding, some good life lessons and you've sort of got the, the security of your own water supply and food supply and so forth if the world were to go to pot. Yeah, I like it. And um, if there's one place, and obviously I'm the Victorian, but um – if there's one place I'd love to live, it'd be up through there. And um, very, very nice part of the world you're in, mate. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So you, I, we met through your time at the Motley Fool, which Lake House now, obviously being owned by the Motley Fool. Yep. Um, but we met when you first started at the Motley Fool. That was going back. You started in 2014. But prior to this, you'd done some really interesting things uh, in the finance industry, but then for yourself as well, which we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, can you take us through that journey? You said that studying like finance and accounting subjects were part of kind of school and uni, but then what led you to the Motley Fool? Like, can you take us yeah, through sure. that and like the key stories there? Yeah. Um, I, I guess there's probably three main things that happened – between school and um, Lake House. And um, I had a couple of years at a university college and sort of played up and, and decided, hey, it's time to, to grow up. And I went and got a job at one of the big four accounting firms as an undergraduate while I completed my studies. And that was the first time I'd had regular income. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't very much at the time, but it allowed me to have regular income to invest. I actually took out a margin loan uh, at that time, this is in the early 2000s, and that allowed me to build a more substantial portfolio than I had more quickly. And, you know, I continued to invest and pay that down. And at times um, when I thought there was a good opportunity, I'd, I'd use that to bring forward the timing of some of my purchases and progressively pay it down over time. And um, I guess that regular income and being in a position where I could really invest and start to, to dial that up a bit. That was that was important to me, but it wasn't until uh, the second moment when I moved to Sydney and I was working for Capital Partners as a graduate. Um, I'd completed part of my CFA. It was always I always worked in after the first two years of university. I always worked and completed some studies. So sort of transitioning from the uni phase, I went straight into doing CFA, and um, that was fun. It, it put a lot of demands on things but um, for sure it does yeah, yeah it's you've been through that it, it's it takes a lot of dedication um and you know some personal sacrifices to your social life and other things but um anyway i got a really good investing grounding at capital partners there was some the, the business had just transitioned from being an independent research provider to being a fund manager oh and right. I didn't know that okay. it was a really interesting stage of the business's life there were a lot of Highly intelligent 
uh, energetic people that were were passionate about investing. Um, many of them have gone on to do great things. Um, you know, Gerald Stack actually recruited me. Uh, he's been at Magellan and, and was one of the early employees at Magellan and sort of heads up their infrastructure side of the business. Um, Dave Prescott went on to set up Lenyon. Uh, a couple of the guys are portfolio managers at Platinum. Um, Milford Cooper's just spread throughout the industry, but there was a really good group of people there, and um, we used to catch up socially quite a lot and just a lot of talk about investing and getting a great foundation in in investing and valuation um, whilst there. And they straddled public and private markets. So um, that gave me a very good grounding in terms of doing due diligence on private deals and you could apply that to public markets as well. So then into the third phase where I actually left the the finance industry for a while in terms of being employed by someone else. Um, I just married my wife. She had a good job um, and, you know, we had a stable income there, had built up a bit of an asset base and it was a good time in our lives to to take a bit of additional risk. And uh, I made some private investments. So looked at about 60 or 70 opportunities, uh, invested in three businesses. Um, one of them I still own today. Um, and we also Bought the farm around that time and and have done a fair bit of development around that and there've been some other private investments along the way but that was that was a point in my life where I made a pretty deliberate decision to go and spend time doing that I always had a um, you know focused a little bit more on private investments but always had a foot in in listed markets as well I have always had a, a listed portfolio and I guess during that time I stumbled across the Motley Fool and I was looking for some extra idea generation for the listed portfolio and signed up to one of their newsletters. Long story short, they uh, advertised for a role. We were living up on the farm at that stage and I threw my hat in the ring because I thought I could help out as an analyst um, in that business and and I wanted to lean into it in listed markets again a bit more and, um, you know, could see an opportunity to get paid for it. So, um, yeah, long story short, ended up at The Motley Fool and convinced some people that, uh, because my background was in funds management, I convinced some people that funds management was a good idea and uh, we ended up with Lake House in 2016. Mm. Um, I might just loop back on something that you mentioned there, which was the um, private investments. You said you looked at 70. You just come from a place where you, like you said you straddled pro- public and private. How did you find those deals for you personally? Like, how, did, Was it through networks or what? How yeah, so we were them? still... Good question, um, and I think that's one of the challenges of private investments is is the deal flow and getting access to good deal flow. Um, so we were living in Sydney at the time, and um, I imagine it's similar in, in Melbourne, but there are enough networks and events, whether it's a, a big four accounting firm that runs some of these events and essentially pre-IPO or, or earlier. Um, Angel Investment Network was, I haven't, followed where it's up to today but it, it was in a good place back then um once you start looking for these things and having conversations with people it just feeds on itself and there is enough deal flow out there and i suspect in an environment like this where money has dried up you can probably find some higher quality ideas now than um when money was free and you know there were some businesses that were getting support that perhaps shouldn't have so you, you you're at the motley fool donny you want to kind of light this spark to move um into funds management yeah and we've had joe on the show uh, a lot of people know joe yep. uh, for many reasons um so the two of you inside the motley fool um why did in your opinion and what did you see at the time that made lake house make sense so the newsletter business is very much DIY. So um, it requires people to actively do something. They get ideas put to them, um, but it's up to them to buy or sell or you know build and manage a portfolio around those ideas. Um, I could see that a lot of people knew, liked what we did, knew and sort of trusted the the philosophy, the investment philosophy and process that had been built around it. And people have big life events and, you know, can become more time poor. Anyway, it was just a matter of offering people a do-it-for-me option. And it's not about these things being mutually exclusive. I know 
plenty of people who invest themselves and also invest in a managed fund and um, it was just a, a good opportunity. Uh, it took a little bit of work to convince people within the firm. So um, as you know, there was a sister business in the US and it it had a um, didn't have the smoothest start to life and, and it made it a little bit harder to convince people. But at the end of the day, um, there was an opportunity there and there was a, a good way to align ourselves with our investors in terms of um, putting money behind and uh, um, sharing in the, the outcomes that we were generating for investors. You started with the small companies fund, right? Yeah. Um, I remember in the early days, and I'm sorry to bring this up, but Bellamy's yeah. it? went into <laughs> like uh, multiple months of uh, suspension, was it, over Christmas yeah, or something? Yeah, that, that was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, this, is a, this is a good walk down memory lane here. I appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, not long after launching the fund, um, Bellamy's announced that they had a bit of a an inventory overhang and that translated into a cash flow problem for the business and um, – yeah, it was a, it was a tough time. Um, it impacted materially impacted the performance of the fund at the time. Um, we were fairly new to it, and um, what was a listed asset effectively started uh, be- became an unlisted asset. And just the valuation around that, and trying to mark to market, you've still got people transacting on a a weekly basis on the unit prices, and you need to make sure you've been equitable to all investors across time so there was a little bit to figure out on on that front and we worked with our re and um and yeah it was a five percent or sub five percent position so we're not talking about um half the portfolio but it was material enough that uh, we needed to work through that and yeah it was these challenges come up from time to time the the world changes um often and that was a an experience that we had pretty early in the life of lake house and yeah, we came through it. It was it was a good lesson for us um, in hindsight, yeah. The growth of Lake House has been um, – it's incredible since that time. And I think a lot of people are caught off guard by how fast you've grown, how well you've done it from a newsletter background, which in some instances hasn't been nearly as successful. If you can speak sensibly to investors and it resonates with them and you build – trust like ultimately that's what so much of our industry comes down to um yeah i think there's a a huge amount of value in a business like yours or or the motley fool where you've got a large retail audience so donnie one of the things that's uh really interesting when people observe lake house from a distance is the fascinations and so that's where this ties back into the first little icebreaker we did um which is structuring the business and the investment approach around fascinations. And I'm curious why you did this as opposed to say, like forming it around sectors, geographies, um, business, other like types of businesses in different ways. Like why is it fascinations? Yeah, I guess you need to, the investable universe is very large and you need to narrow it down somehow. And there are some fairly conventional ways to do that. Lakehouse decided to, to go down a path of, fascinations and it's really just about economic models that that stand out um not all businesses are created equal and i guess that's something that resonates strongly with me and and the team at lake house and then you need to think about well how do we narrow our focus and where do we want to to narrow that focus and those economic models of network effects ip and extremely loyal customers they're great places to compound wealth over the long term. And um, yeah, it was just a, a natural place to be. And we've got leads for each of the fascinations and these aren't mutually exclusive. Like if you picture a Venn diagram, you might have a fascination and isolation for a business or there might be two that overlap or three that overlap and the overlap varies and you know different businesses. But at, at the core, those economic models are what matter and, and what we think will drive outsized returns over time. Um, so Erwin, Lee, Erwin Tan leads our network's fascination. Uh, Kenny Mai, our loyalty fascination, and Abby Malin, the IP fascination. And people can build up expert um, subject matter expertise within those verticals. They're not isolated to them, but it helps you turn over rocks with a higher velocity um, as people become 
you know, more familiar with that. A good example is so Nick Thompson, who who now manages the Global Fund. He used to be the the lead on uh, the loyalty fascination and has built up a great database of standardising LTV to um, to CAC calculations for enterprise software businesses domestically, but across the globe as well. And um, that's been a really useful resource, and it it helps us cut to the chase a lot quicker to understand where businesses are at, where they sit relative to their peers, in a very consistent way. So that's an example of. Um, how it allows us to to move faster and have that subject matter expertise within within a certain area. So it's does, helpful. Does it um so like you got extreme customer loyalty, you got IP, et cetera. Do these do they do you find that you're biased towards companies over time when you look at the composition of the portfolio? Certainly biased towards certain sectors as their as their um like I software, for example, you mentioned uh, ERP um I imagine SaaS companies are in there because they're highly recurring in nature. They've Indeed. got wide margins, et cetera. Yep. yep. Yeah. So you do gravitate towards certain sectors as as they're defined by the market. Um, there's been some funny examples of of companies being uh, bounced from technology to communication sector or whatever. You know, the, we don't pay too much attention to what sector they're in, but we understand that the market does and um, people like to bucket things. But um, yeah, we tend to cluster around technology, consumer, uh, and healthcare. Mm. Um, I know we had breakfast one day many years ago uh, in Hawthorne, actually, um, down in Melbourne. And I think you may have, I don't know if you were in town to speak with uh, the guys at ProMedicus, but you may have been. I can't remember. I don't know if you remember. But um, I know that I you do remember. Oh, yeah, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you followed that business for a, a long time, like you personally as well. And we talk about it a bit on the show because it actually has been the best performing company on the stock market for over 10 years. It's it's like ProMedic is Daylight and there's Ultim and a few other businesses that sit underneath that. Um, and I'm hoping you can maybe, first of all, just for anyone that doesn't know what this business does, just tell us what they do. But then how you went about understanding the business and what caught your attention? Yeah, I guess... Um it was one that was familiar through the the Motley Fool days, and uh, there's a bit of history that precedes this. And uh, shout out to Claude. Claude was probably the first person that ever raised the company with me, and uh, I know it's been good to him. So, <laughs> well done, Claude. Um, yeah. So we did meet with the with Sam and Clayton in their Richmond office in about August 2016. So it predates the fund by a little bit. It was one of the first investments that we made. Um, but getting back to your question, what does the business do? Uh, in very simple terms, it's sort of healthcare software. Um, but more specifically, they provide practice. The historical business, or the the sort of the original format, was um, practice management software for radiologists. And the real turning point for that business came in two thousand and nine, when um, you know, in the aftermath of the GFC, uh, Sam made what I think was one of the best transactions that I know of in the Australian market and um, purchased the the streaming software that Visage 7 is built off um, out of Germany. Um, and that has been built into what is the beating heart of ProMedicus today. And I guess the, the, the real feature around that is um, the speed, functionality, scalability of that. And it really comes down to streaming versus downloading. Um, and you've had a situation in the radiology industry and just you know elsewhere as well where file size has exploded. So you've had digital cameras come in and replace sort of lead-based film and, and that sort of thing. And file size absolutely expo- exploded. And the importance of being able to move large files around efficient quickly efficiently being able to manipulate them has become increasingly important and that's really been the heart of visage the visages <coughs> excuse me edge in building out the market position that they have today there's a lot of optionality that hangs off that as well sort of um you know they've been working for a long time on going into cardiology and other ologies and basically using the same base technology to be able to look at large <clears throat> large valuable um, images and manipulate them off-site so um, 
a big theme over the last couple of years has been healthcare companies. For the longest time, patient data was seen as really, really sensitive, and, and it is. And the approach from the industry was, we need to keep this on premise. Like we need to have a guard with a you know a lock and key, keeping this secure. And there was um, they weren't interested in looking at the cloud. Anyway, fast forward a few years, and there has been a strong adoption in cloud software by the healthcare industry. And and as those barriers have come down, it has further advantaged Prometicus. It is just a very um, thin software stack that can facilitate a radiologist working from their garage on the other side of the world, looking at images for half a dozen or a dozen hospitals. And that scalability and the adoption of cloud has really helped it to, to accelerate its growth to a point where most of the RFPs today um, you need to tick the box on cloud and um, Prometicus is, is very well placed and uh, I look forward to them moving into other ologies and so forth in time. And, you know, they've got their their PAC system as well. So um, allowing hospitals to move even more images uh, onto their platform and stream it in the same way. So um, that was a long and winding no, answer no, no, to I explain like what it. the business does. Yeah, no, 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 no. I like it, mate. Um, but so... One of the criticisms, right, of Prometicus in those days was, you know, this company, I think at the time was spending like $2 million on R&D or $3 million. It was tiny, whatever it was, right? And then people are like, well, how can that compete against Fujifilm and how can it compete against blah, 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 blah. And if you're looking at a business like that, okay, how did, what are some of the, I guess, factors that made you get comfortable building a position in that? Like you said, you met with Sam and Clayton, um like what was it about them maybe did you have to did you go to any radiology clinics or conferences or how did you get comfortable with that business yeah i guess um we're very much attracted to founder-led businesses and um in my time investing not not all businesses are created equal and not all founders are created equal and i'm developing a, a better nose for which founders I want to align with and um, those which you need to be a little bit more careful about. And what it really comes down to is sort of um, a little bit of ego and and the promotional effort that they put into their business. And you need to accept some of that because th- these businesses need capital, right? But anyway, um, Sam was just very open, honest and trustworthy from day one. He is one that always He's very conscious of what expectations he sets in the market and never really gives guidance, is very vague about pipeline, um, doesn't set expectations that can trip him up and he's just got a long-term focus on what he's doing. He's deeply passionate about it. That shone through from the very first time that we spoke to him and um, it was just easy to build some trust and alignment around what he was doing. And there were some capital allocation decisions before we owned the business. So um, he conducted a buyback pretty early on in the business and, you know, we ran the numbers on that. And I I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head, but it was hugely value creative. We bought into the business at the end of 2016 um, when we launched the fund and they conducted another buyback thereafter. It might have been December of that year into the start of the year. He's just got a really good track record of capital allocation around his share buybacks, um, made that masterful deal in in buying the core technology in, in 2009. Um, I think he's setting himself up for that. Again, now he's he's got an arsenal of cash and um, has bought back some shares throughout this year, um, but has certainly built a decent arsenal. And I think some of the uh, AI technology that's that's built the ecosystem that's sort of built around some of their imagery. Um, it, there's a good chance it throws up some opportunities for him. So um, really about trust, understanding his track record of capital allocation, warming to that, and and you sort of incrementally build up your knowledge over time and and that relationship. And um, yeah, there hasn't been anything that's chipped away at it um, over time. Yeah, there, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to make a show about Prometicus today. We, neither of us do that want to do that but um i think it just serves to illustrate how you think about businesses in general and it's a company that a lot of people can relate to i think a lot of it comes down to what we there are many 
computer programs and a lot of smart people in our industry and the quantitative analysis is a well-worn path. Uh, something that we try to to focus more on and, and we're still putting increasingly more effort behind it is the qualitative side and understanding the cultural aspects of businesses and the mindset of the leaders and capital allocators around those businesses that allow them to to thrive over time. If you've got an operator there that has a, a short-term mindset and you know that, then it's probably not somewhere you want to place capital and it's less likely to compound well over time. That's part of the reason why, you know, founders tend to be good places to align capital. I think there's a study that Morgan Stanley did a number of years ago and they probably update it uh, fairly frequently, but you're talking about in the order of 3% a year outperformance of family-owned businesses or founder-led businesses outperforming and, you know, rule of 72, what do you – Every 25 years, you're sort of more than doubling or less than that. You're more than doubling your investment returns from that incremental 3%. And you know, we're relatively young guys. That's I'll take that every day of the week if I can um, get that sort of advantage over that period of time. So these people, as in founders or family-led businesses, this is their legacy to the world and they care deeply, more deeply than a salaried CEO um, about their businesses. And if you can – find the right ones that have a long-term mindset, um, the data says more often than not that that'll work out well for you, better than um, buying collectively all of the businesses in a passive fund, for example. Yeah. Um, the question that often gets brought up when people get to know Lake House, whether it's the global fund or the, the small companies, small companies soft-closed, by the way, is it? Uh, it has soft-closed. Um, we always said that we'd close that as capacity approach 500 million we you know um myself and my friends and family have money in that fund and we've got no interest in um sacrificing performance uh for being large so we did soft close that in uh february of 2021 i believe it was if i remember rightly and um just with the market pulling back it's opened up some capacity so it's open again. Uh, okay. I, I look forward to the day where we get to soft close it again, though, Alan. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, that's a problem that happens with a lot of uh, particularly small cap fund managers is the, the best ones fill up really quickly, right? Because you can't just keep going forever. But um, one of the things that people observe when they look at the website or they just read your, your updates is the portfolios are very concentrated. Yeah, they are. Um, and in particular, the top five positions. Why did you decide to go down that path and why is that optimal for what you offer? Yeah, I guess that was always um, – so when Joe and I set up the business, it was – we're a small team. We were two people for a long stretch of time and um, you need to have focus. The fascinations helps uh, go down that path a, a good bit. Um, but also it doesn't make a lot of sense to own your 31st, 41st, 51st best idea and you know, various studies point to the fact that investment managers make their best returns out of their highest conviction positions. So lean into that. And I think beyond that, I think that um, the market is really separating. If you're an, a, an index hugging active manager, I think that they're much more exposed, much more vulnerable, much more you know, at risk these days than in the past. And I see a lot more... Uh, asset allocators, financial planners go into a bit more of a barbell strategy that is, okay, let's get our market beta risk out of a very low cost index product. And um, you do a great job of helping facilitate that for people. But then if you want to something that's a little bit higher oc octane that can generate some outperformance, I think going to managers that have high active share, <clears throat> excuse me, high active share like we do at Lake House, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the investment philosophy and process needs to resonate with investors because of the concentrated nature. You can have some pretty big moves, and um, you know, we've we've certainly experienced that over the last twelve months with the heavy sell-off in growth stocks. Um, that's par for the course in in investing, but I still um, believe very deeply that it is a great way to compound wealth over the long term and this is a long-term game that that we're in and um mm. yeah we're still early in that innings yeah i like it um so th this brings i guess when people see that i 
for what it's worth, I agree completely. I think when we talk about on the show, we talk about risk budget. We also talk about fee budgets. Mm -hmm. And if so, if you think about it, if you're building a portfolio, you've got so you can have your passive core portfolio, then where you take those bets, you want them to be the right bets uh, and you're willing to pay for it typically, like if they're good managers, right? Um, but when people think about concentration in particular, they think about downside as well, mm -hmm. right? So how do you know when you're wrong on a company, I guess? Is there like a checklist or some way you think about that? I don't know, if, even maybe if you use an example, if you have one, but I'm just putting it on the spot here, sorry. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, how do you know when you're wrong and how do you protect that downside? Yeah, um, I'd say it's one of the challenges and something that I've reflected on a lot over the last 12 months. Um, a, a challenge with our investing philosophy and style of being long-term, being patient, trying to filter out the noise is that you're less reactionary. And um, we have been guilty of thesis creep in the past. And um, it's something that we're much more attuned to these days. And this is, you know, this is something that came to the fore in the first year of of running Lake House and the second and third. It's it sort of incrementally um, been built and you sort of recognize it more over time and, and um, try to tweak your processes to, to pick that up more quickly. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a balance of acknowledging that hey, this six monthly result, yeah, it might be noise, short-term noise within a long-term thesis, but hey, there's enough here that it's dented our conviction. We need to take some chips off the table here. Um, to completely exit a position, the price needs to be at extraordinary levels that we can't justify the valuation um, even at, you know, at, at a higher end. We don't like selling on price alone, but, um, uh, but the most common way is a thesis breaks and things move pretty quick, quickly in small's land. And um, it's happened a few times where a thesis breaks, a bad capital allocation decision is is made by a management team that you don't support or don't have confidence in. And um, you know we tend to want to be there for the long term, but you need to balance that with the world's a, a very dynamic place, and you need to adjust and adapt to what's happening out there and um, try to do it as quickly and efficiently as you can. So. Mm. Um, yeah, I remember one of those, I think it was one of those positions was RPM Global at the time. I think they sold their geogas and you guys voiced concerns about like that capital allocation decision. But while we're on this topic, I think this is really valuable because it plays a big role in what you think about is, um, and this is a bit of a cheeky one, but it's who, as you've done this for quite a few years now, who is the best capital allocator you've come across? Maybe if you wanted to take that at the CEO or at the investor level, um, who do you? Who have you come across and been really impressed by? Um, well, as I touched on before, I think uh, Sam's transaction in two thousand and nine is is one of the best that that I've seen, um, and he's got a great track record on his share buybacks. Uh, Tony Wall, Objective Corporation. It's a business that we um, used to own, and um, Tony similarly has a, a great capital allocation track record if you go and have a look at his his buybacks. And um, I guess in terms of it happening at scale, so Mark Leonard at Constellation Software on the on the global fund side, it's a holding there. Um, it's one that Nick has covered for a long time. Kenny Mai covers it now. Um, it has – Constellation really um, – what's the word I'm looking for here? Sort of institutionalised – capital allocation and slightly different model to Berkshire. So Berkshire sort of concentrates the capital allocation decisions in head office, whereas um, Constellation sort of pushes it down. But that framework has delivered, I don't know the latest numbers, but well north of 20% compound per annum um, since inception, buying vertical software businesses across the globe. And um, for someone to be able to build such a large and sustaining business off a capital allocation model, it's a it's a hard one to ignore. And you know, um, mm. I think there's a, a good bit that can be learned from that. It, I, it's it's harder in the Australian smalls landscape. Businesses tend to be much earlier in their life cycle, and you don't have the same longevity as you know a standout like a, a Berkshire or a Constellation or, mm. or such. So, yeah, it's uh, Mark Leonard did this interview once, and he 
it was like, I don't know if you ever come across it. It was on tw- Twitter for a while. And I think it's since been taken down, but it was for one of the, the business units. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a podcast and he appeared on it and because he's typically very shy. Yes. Like he doesn't really make a, a, a scene or anything. And I remember just dialing into that. I've since lost it and I'm devastated. Uh, Kevin Fung, if you're listening, thanks for sharing it. But um, yeah, I, I, it's just like unbelievable. Those letters are fantastic. It's a masterclass in capital allocation too. So couldn't agree with you more there, mate. Um, yeah. Uh, look, I, this is a, no insight here, but, um, you know, Jeff Bezos and what he's done and the whole mentality of um, mm. failing quickly and the capital allocation track record that he's built around that business and trying different things and um, recognising when you're wrong quickly. I, I, I think th- there are plenty of examples the world over, but, yeah, there's a couple on the global side there for you. Mm. Yeah, um, so many great companies in that list. Um, there was actually one company, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, that I couldn't remember the name of uh, in the global fund. It was the second position and i was like oh, i've never heard of this business so it's one if you're looking for uh, more of donnie's or the team's insights please head to the lake house website and just read the letters it's just awesome so mate a bit of a fun one is again is if you could take one investor uh, they could be an investor they could be like an author that you read or whoever and one ceo or founder or whatever to dinner at the same time well actually i said dinner um, but I was thinking if it was Donnie, it's probably maybe a pot and a palmer um, or maybe just like, you know, I don't know, whatever you do. Any of that works. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, if you could take them somewhere and just sit down with them and talk to them for a while, who would they be? Yeah, um, I guess on the investor side, um, so I, I own an excavator. I only want older people to operate it. They've made all the mistakes in their life and they're going to be gentle and mindful of their own safety in in operating the machine. And I think that there's a lot to be said um, for that approach in life and and investing. So, you know, there's the obvious ones, the the mongers of the world. Um, And uh, I I, I love how um, to the point and almost politically incorrect that he can be – you know, Warren's very folksy and all that sort of thing, but um, he's one. He's got an immense amount of investing experience and you can learn from the mistakes and things that they've seen. But I guess trying to pick someone that this isn't really off pissed, but um, we I read the um, Seth Klarman's Margin of Safety back in the Capital Partners days and um, it was profoundly sensible Um and I'm probably overdue to go and read it again, to be honest. He invests differently to to what I've gravitated towards in terms of the growth investing at Lakehouse. But um, someone else that's fairly media shy, but I think just has a a different way of thinking and is a very deep thinker. And I, I think it would be an engaging and very insightful dinner conversation or, mm. you know, pot and palmy conversation with Seth. If, Did if you say palmy? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's a Queensland thing. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. No, it, I think it's pronounced Palmer. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll work on that. Like, like, you know, the AFL is uh, the sport. Yeah. Not, not so much. Um, <laughs> with roots in far north Queensland, I'm uh, deeply a league supporter, mate, and, and a Queenslander at that. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. No doubt, mate. Um, okay. So your um, upbringing on a farm, um, now living on a farm, I think people. Like I, I love chatting to you because you just bring this down to earth nature to the way you think about life and investing and everything like this, mate. So it's a it's a real treat. But um, I remember you wrote an article. This was a long time ago, and I can't remember the company. It was for the Motley Fool site. Um, it may have been Rural Funds Group or uh, one of the businesses that was listed. I think I know the article you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think you made a comment in there that. Um, in your experience, typically the best farms and the best agricultural assets are intergenerational. And so it makes it quite difficult to um, make a lot of money in the public sphere in that way. Is that a fair, do you think that's a fair assessment? Like, no, I don't even know if I got that right, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there was something in there along those lines. Um, I guess my familiarity with agriculture, and, you know, there are many different parts to agriculture, but. Um, they're often 24-7 type businesses and it's hard for a, a corporate to compete with a family operator in that sense. The family operated businesses, it, it's just, it's an extension of them, who they are as as people and what they do. And um, 
I think that they just have a, a fundamental advantage in a in a what I think is frankly a difficult industry. So we have a question on our our checklist at Lakehouse that is, what are the ex, um, what are the uncontrollable externalities that could sink the business? <clears throat> and when I think about agriculture, there are a few there. So typically, most agricultural businesses are price takers, and that can be in an environment where you're competing against producers that are heavily subsidized or supported in some way by their governments you know if you think of global wheat prices global milk prices insert other soft commodity um and then also and perhaps the biggest one is you're beholden to weather in a lot of cases and um that creates a lot more volatility in the cash flow of the businesses and um i don't think it's an industry that's well suited to high levels of debt but there are periods of time where that happens and um, if you're in an industry where you can have a couple of great years and then a couple of doozies, you know, we had a four or five year drought in, in parts of New South Wales and Queensland not that long ago. Um, if you're subject to those sort of uncontrollable externalities, then you need to have your capital structure right and not be exposed when the tide inevitably goes out on on the weather front and um yeah i guess there were some foundational lessons there for me growing bananas uh, i remember picking bananas one christmas after cyclone joy came through um and just wiped out the crop and you, you just you can harvest what's there for a couple of days but your income's gone for the next 12 months from from that and it's a tough place to be and similarly for cattle or uh sugarcane i think it was 1995 the industry got deregulated so the comfortable pricing that farmers were used to then uh, that got taken away. Similar thing happened in the milk industry, um, and yeah, it's a it's a tough place to be. I have a lot of respect for for people that do it, and there are many people that that do it well. Um, but like I said, it's really those farming families that that stand out. And there's been a trend towards we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole here. Uh, like there's it. been a, there's been a trend towards uh, agricultural investment by um, insurance and pension funds and uh in, in recent years i'll be interested to see how that plays out there used to be a good bit of that so uh amp um in its heyday it owned stanbroke pastoral company one of the largest land holdings in australia at the time um things sort of came full circle there and you know it it's interesting seeing some of the liquidity challenges around at the moment and the push towards unlisted assets generally it, yeah it, i'm i'm interested to see how all of that works out um uncorrelated returns and all of that i understand the the, mm. the concept behind it and the attraction to it mm. um, i hope the actuaries figured out that once um listed products fall that means that the bigger part of your pie is unlisted and you can't liquidate yeah of unlisted. It, <laughs> it, it's an interesting time it sort of reminds me of um during the gfc or in the the shadows of the gfc when april was writing to the big pension funds and um asking them to you know, quite often a lot of the best performing ones had, this is going back then, had the best returns um, because you don't need to mark them to market as often. And um, the valuation can be independent, but a, a managed process. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we'll, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's we'll a, it's a conversation for a pot and palmy sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. If you had $100 million, mate, how would you spend your day differently? Um, I know what I'm supposed to say here, Owen, but uh, <laughs> sorry, Stuart. Um, look, I'm, I'm, um, I love what I do. I love the team that, that I work with. Lakehouse means a lot to me. Um, I would give the vast majority of that money to Lakehouse to manage. Um, I would want to still be involved. I'm, I'm not someone who wants to go and buy an island or a yacht and sit on there and, and not interact with people. I think that would actually be quite boring. Uh, I like to be busy. I like to be... You know, involved in things, and uh, Lake House would certainly be a big part of that. I'd probably spend more time um, turning my farm into the estate that I have pictured in my head. Uh, so, and yeah, I guess walking my kids to school every day, um, and you know, walking just so that you can slow time down and and spend more um, quality time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, because obviously um, you live near Byron, and you your office is here in Sydney. How often do you get down here? 
Uh, in short, as often as I need to. Yeah. Pre-COVID, it was a lot more. Yeah, um, I remember. Sort of every two weeks, um, I'd basically camp down here during reporting season. Used to have to um, – one of the main reasons I came down, besides seeing the team – was for company meetings and uh, that has completely changed through COVID. So as you know, a lot of these company meetings have, have gone to have gone online. Um, Zoom and the likes have, have been a huge boon to being able to live and work remotely. Um, it, and there's obviously the um, societal acceptance of it. So I've been living up there almost 11 years, you know, co-founded Lake House from there, did my whole time working at the Motley Fool from up there. It's it's um it's a well worn path for me, and it's just been a, a gradual shift over time. And with three kids, seven and under, um, it, it's it's been helpful. Uh, being able to spend more time, it's yeah, it's good balance. Mm. Um, yeah, I I I know it's it, it would be a lot to come down, but uh, thankfully that's one of the things that's been great coming out of COVID. Yeah, F- fewer fl- fewer flights, less spending at hotels. On. Sorry if you work at a hotel or own one, but um, yeah, it's you know it's made life a lot easier, better balance for a lot of folks too. It's something that we've been accustomed to with uh, the Motley Fool as well, um, being able to do that. Um, this is more of a personal question, Donnie. It's the second last one I've got for you, which is um, you've spent a lot of time with private investments, which you mentioned not only professionally but also privately in your own time, um, but. I'm curious how you think that skew might change over time, um, because you have been on both in both camps for a long time. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I spoke um, about recently was the, I guess, the shifting in the mix in markets yep. overall. Yep. Fewer listed companies. Yep. More investment in private companies and scale ups and staying private, if that makes sense. And how you think that that might affect even the way you invest? Yeah. Look, I, <clears throat> I always have had um, a good portion of wealth in listed equities. I think that will always be the case. Um, I enjoy looking at businesses and and finding what I think are better businesses than than average. I, I, I think that we can typically do that well over the long term. So that'll always be part of it. But, um, yeah, the private side's always been of interest uh, I think there's opportunity to get a little bit closer to the music and influence outcomes there and I enjoy that as well and I think that'll be a material part of of my portfolio going forward um, but yeah I guess like most things it's it's just about balance and um, mm. yeah it'll it'll be a, a balance based on circumstances and stage of life at, at each of those points I think it's really um, impressive that you've been able to you know, understand business first and foremost from a very young age it seems that I don't know if it's exposure to the family business or what have you but to be able to understand that a business is a business no matter where you find it if it's on public markets or in private markets and even some analysts I, I often think just can't reconcile like they they're so used to like the statements should look like this this should be presented to me and they fail to grasp that this is just a business like it's the same as the thing down in the corner shop there you know um just on a different level so um and i just obviously being someone who talks a lot about etfs and that sort of stuff the implications there could be interesting over the long term yeah but um the hardest question i've got for you john is actually the last one um right <laughs> which is i always think about this question for myself and i think yeah. i don't know what i'd say so i don't know i'll just try it on with you and then we'll see what happens but what's one thing you believe about investing business or just life, that few people would agree with you on. Okay. Um, I guess uh, I might have a go at answering this in two parts. Sure. Um, the first one, people – actually, I'll come back to that. So the something that I think plenty of people would disagree about is I think the share market should only be open one day a week. I think that um, – by having markets open as much as they are, it creates a lot of noise, it creates a lot of volatility. And as a society, we end up allocating more what could otherwise be productive human capital to, you know, very smart people work in our industry. Um, I don't know that all of the volatility and the ecosystem that that builds around that is necessarily 
valuable or productive to society and that could be reallocated in other ways. I think if people had weekly uh, liquidity, that would be sufficient. And, um, yeah, I just I think we could uh, be in a, a different or better place if, if we had that sort of focus and allocated some time and resources elsewhere. Um, I'm sure that's controversial. I guess something less controversial and, and probably underscores this conversation is I, um, I believe in building a life that you don't need a vacation from. And uh, that's hopefully that's something that resonates with people and, and maybe is a bit of a, a takeaway in terms of finding the, the balance that they want in their life and what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I do like to vacation where you live. So um, <laughs> I, I look forward to your next visit. Yeah. Owen. <laughs> um, mate, this, this has been a real treat for me because we've known each other for so long. I've never recorded anything with you before. And I think you just have so much to offer. I actually only think we've just scratched the surface here today. Um, if people wanted to find out more about Lake House uh, and you, where would they go? Uh, to the website that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some great people that work there. Uh, Nick Thompson, Erwin Tan, and the rest of the team. Um, mm. If you get an opportunity to to read an article by them or or meet them in person, uh, I'd encourage you to do that. I, I think they're fantastic people and mm. and fantastic investors. So um, just reach out to anyone on the the team or lean into any articles that we have out there, and yeah. you'll learn a bit. I hope. Yeah, and there's also the webinars. Um, so the webinars are available on the website as well. Um, you guys answer questions. You go through portfolios. It's really good stuff. So um, if you want, I don't, I don't know many funds that do this like so professionally and consistently. So if you do want to learn about more of the businesses that Donny watches and you know researches, just go and check out the Lake House Capital website. I'll put a link in the show notes. Donny, thanks. I don't know if you come down from Byron for this. I hope not. Like I hope you had more important things than me. But uh, mate, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me here in Sydney. Great being here, Owen. And uh, thank you. I hope we get to do it again someday.